Okay, uh, I think uh, we can get started now. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I want to welcome everybody to our online census workshop. Uh, I'm Neil Kilgren, Senior Planner at the Puget Sound Regional Council and our Census Specialist. This is the first of two workshops that the PSRC and the Census Bureau is putting on. Uh, the second will take place in June, uh, tentatively set for June 2nd. Uh, we'll have details um, on that later this week. Uh, the topics for that second session will be uh, the new differential privacy policy, uh, the new data portal, data.census.gov, and 2020 census activities in our state. Today's workshop will focus on economic programs and tools. There will be three sessions, each starting at about 10 minutes after the hour and ending at the top of the hour, including time for Q&A. There, there will then be 10 minutes until the start of the next session, so time for all you to go get a fresh cup of coffee. Be sure to mute your mics, except for when you want to ask a question during the Q&A. You can also type in questions in the chat box, and these will be read, read out during the Q&A. I will now turn things over to Heidi Crawford, a data dissemination specialist for our region, who has been instrumental in helping, to pull the, uh, help, helping me pull this workshop together. She will mention some important resources for census data and programs, and then introduce our speakers. Heidi? Okay, great. Thanks, Neil. As Neil said, my name is Heidi Crawford, and I am one of the few data dissemination specialists across the country that's available to conduct trainings and respond to inquiries from our data users and other stakeholders. And I support Alaska, Oregon, and Washington. And then in addition to data, I'm also currently splitting my time working as a liaison for our statistics and schools program for the 2020 census. Those of you in attendance may have seen me last year uh, at the workshop that Neil had. Um, as he said, I was there last year and then am helping him coordinate the activities and workshops for this year for today and on June 2nd. My contact information is here of where you can reach me. Also, we have our general uh, information line and email. So if you're interested in other trainings or have a data question, you can reach out via those um, numbers and emails. And then I'd also like to mention our Census Academy. So if you have not checked it out, please do. Uh, we have a variety of mechanisms for training up there. We have what are data gems, which are kind of those quick, if you see those YouTube videos of how to bake a cake in two to three minutes, we have several gems on a variety of different data topics and our data tools. We also have information about our webinar series, and I wanted to share that because our speakers today, Andy, Linda, and Arlene, have all been participating in webinar series uh, for econ. We also have other areas of the Bureau represented. So please go up there if you're interested in looking what we've done in the past. We have those recordings up there. And if you're interested in seeing what there is for the future, uh, Andy and Linda and Erlene, like I said, have been participating in this series. They've done a number of them and they have a number more that will be scheduled throughout the year. So if you like what you see today, please come back and sign up to see more of what we have. And then we also have several data courses up there and we'll be adding more throughout the year. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our speakers today. We've got uh, Andy Haight, Linda Lee, and Erlene Dow from our economics area. And Andy, go ahead. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Erlene. Um, excuse me, thank you so much, um, Heidi. Um, my name is Andy Haight. I'm an economist at the U.S. Census Bureau at our headquarters office here in Maryland. And I've been working at the Bureau since September of 1987, <clears throat> so going on 33 years. And I have spent my entire career working in what we call our economic directorate, which is the part of the Census Bureau that is responsible for all of our business surveys. Um, after I do my presentation for this first hour, uh, my colleague Linda Lee is going to be coming up and talking uh, with you all 
about some of our new programs and data tools uh, that we have available at the Census Bureau. Uh, three brand new data surveys uh, will be covered by Linda, business formation statistics, the small business pulse survey, and the new uh, annual business survey. And then after Linda finishes and you all get another break, uh, then my colleague Erlene Dow and I will come up, uh, come back, and I'll take a very quick walk through a data tool called Census Business Builder, and then Erlene will close us out with a walkthrough of a data tool called TSEO, the post-secondary employment outcomes, and finally the veteran employment outcomes. But to get us started on my section of the presentation, um, I want to talk about the information that we have available from the economic census and give you all an update on sort of where we are. Now, you'd have to be living under a rock to not know that right now we are conducting the largest undertaking that we do at the Census Bureau, uh, the decennial census. Um, hopefully you all by now have received your invitation to respond to the decennial census or the form itself. Um, and hopefully you all have already completed your census form. If you have not, I would encourage you all to do it. However, the decennial census is not the only thing <clears throat> we do at the Census Bureau. If I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, I know what you do once every 10 years, what do you do the other nine? I would be retired by now. Um, in fact, we conduct more than 130 different monthly, quarterly, and annual surveys each and every single year. It includes, those surveys include, of course, the decennial census and the American Community Survey. Uh, the ACS is our largest demographic program. It's probably a survey that many of you are already familiar with. But in addition to those demographic surveys, we also do a number of business programs. Those 58 business surveys that we conduct at the Census Bureau can be visualized in the pyramid on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, those 58 surveys include monthly and quarterly programs, annual programs, and quinquennial programs, I love that word, uh, your word of the day, uh, which means every five years. And when you look at this pyramid, I want you to sort of think of two things. The first sort of truism of the Census Bureau is the more timely the data they are, the less detailed it is. So at the very top of the program of this pyramid is our monthly and quarterly surveys. These are the surveys that you hear about on the evening news very often uh, when the monthly retail sales number for March were released just a couple of weeks ago. We saw a massive decline in retail activity in the United States uh, because of COVID. These are fabulous surveys, very, very timely, but with only two exceptions, they only publish data at the national level. The second tier of the pyramid is our annual programs. They are done annually, as the name implies, and they provide more detail than what is available in our monthly and quarterly survey. So, for example, two of our most popular annual programs are county business patterns and non-employer statistics. These two programs produce data down to the county level by detailed industries, but even those two programs, as detailed as they are, are pretty limited in terms of the data variables that are shown. So at the very bottom of the pyramid is the economic census. It is our baseline and our benchmark survey. We do it every five years, on the years ending with two and seven, and it forms the basis of nearly all of the annual, quarterly, and monthly surveys that are sitting on top of it, uh, both, both, both virtually and actually. Um, the economic census serves as that universe. It creates the universe that we use to draw from the sample. So if we don't get a good economic census every five years, each of those annual quarterly and monthly surveys that are baseline and benchmarked back to it are then impacted. Because it is our baseline survey, it's also the most detailed one that we conduct. And we're gonna walk through some of those details today uh, to talk about the information that is available. So when you think about that level of detail that is shown in the economic census, it is the most detailed of our programs in a number of ways. First, it is the most detailed in terms of the industry coverage. 
We include data for nearly every two through six digit NAICS code. That's the North American Industry Classification System codes that we cover at the Census Bureau. There are a couple of exclusions. We do not publish data in the Economic Census for Agriculture, which is NAICS 11, and that is primarily because USDA does. When I first started at the Census Bureau, we actually used to conduct the Census of Agriculture at the Census, uh, at the Census Bureau. In 1997, we asked USDA to take over um, for it, and so they now do that. There are also a few other exclusions that are, um, that are not counted in the economic census. For example, colleges and universities are not covered uh, in the educational services sector in the economic census because the National Center for Education Statistics publishes that data. And I provided a link to the actual list of all of the different exclusions that are there. I do want to remind you all that these presentation materials are going to be made available to you after the presentation today, so you won't have to frantically write down that URL um, there to see what that listed exclusions are. Uh, the Economic Census is also our most detailed program in terms of geography. As you can see on the slide, we publish data down to the place level. Place is the word that we generically use to refer to both incorporated cities towns, villages, and boroughs, and also unincorporated areas, or what the Census Bureau calls a census-designated place. The town that I live in in Maryland, Crofton, Maryland, is not a municipality. It is not an incorporated city or town, and yet the Census Bureau still does publish data for Crofton CDP, census-designated place, because users need information about the economy and the population that live in the town of Crofton. We publish data for both, and we use a population or jobs cutoff of 2,500 or more. So that means towns that at least have that have at least 2,500 population or 2,500 jobs in Washington State are covered separately by the economic census. Businesses that are physically located in towns that are smaller than 2,500 population still are counted, but they are published in something called the balance of county. The Economic Census is also our most detailed program in terms of the other dimensions uh, that are published. I get questions all the time about business size data. People will say, Andy, does census have data on small businesses? The answer is yes, but I always then ask them, well, what do you mean by small? Is your definition of small based upon an individual business location, what we call an establishment? We have that data. Is your definition of business based upon the size of the firm, the company? So you don't want to look at just an individual location. You want to look at all the locations within a company. We have that data too. We also, I also ask them, do you have, you are, are you interested in data by employment size, by how many employees the business has? We have that data. Or is your definition based upon the revenue size, the sales size of that business? We have that as well. So all four of those dimensions are shown in the economic census, and we even have other dimensions like franchise status, legal form of organization, and a wide variety of other um, cross tabs. It's also our most detailed program in terms of the data variables that are shown. In the economic census for every single industry, we publish data on the number of establishments, employment, payroll, and some measure of output whether that's sales, shipments, receipts, or revenue. Every industry publishes those four basic statistics, but we also have variables that are published that are specific to individual sectors of the U.S. economy. So, for example, in the manufacturing sector, we publish detailed information on capital expenditures and assets and depreciations and inventories, um, other expenses, et cetera. The economic census is also unique in that we publish something called product line data. These are the detailed products and services that businesses provide. So for example, we would send a form to a grocery store that would ask that grocery store to report not only their total sales, but their sales broken out by the different products and services that they provide. Baked goods, chicken, and, and other poultry products, canned goods. Um, tobacco products, et cetera. Those detailed products are collected and published in the economic census. 
Now, in terms of where the data are actually published, they are released on data.census.gov, which is our newest data dissemination platform. Linda will actually be talking a little bit about the data.census.gov platform, and I'll be doing a demo later of our Census Business Builder data tool, which where we will also be publishing the economic census. The data are also available in a few other platforms as well, including tools like QuickFacts. Now, at the very bottom of this slide, I have a very quick note about some data that we historically have published in surveys called the Survey of Business Owners and the Annual Survey of Entrepreneurs. These have been our two programs that sort of blur the lines between demographic and economic data. Because what they publish are information on the demographic characteristics of the business owner, the race, ethnicity, gender, and veteran status of the business owner. Now, these two surveys have been done, being done for a number of years, but this year we are replacing both SBO and ASE with the brand new annual business survey that Linda will be talking about. Now, because the economic census is our most detailed program, it takes us a long time to get the data released. What you're looking at on the screen right now is the release schedule for the 2017 economic census. And as you can see, we started releasing data from the economic census in December of last year. Now, I know you may be thinking, wow, September 2019, and you're publishing 2017 economic census data, what gives? Well, we've had some budgetary challenges that caused a delay in the mail out. And then we had something called the government shutdown they added about another four or five month delay on top of the delay that we had already um, established, you know, established. Uh, essentially, we're about nine months behind where we would have been for the 2012 economic census. Right now, we are in the midst of releasing something called the geographic area statistics, which you can see is that second grouping on the left-hand side. Those data started being released in January of this year, and we'll continue through November, although I have it on good authority that it's likely we will be finished closer to August or September to get all those data. The geographic area data flow out on a state by sector basis, and we'll see some information about that flow of data in just a moment. After the geographic area reports come of our, come of our later product products like the product statistics, the establishment and firm size reports and our miscellaneous subjects reports, and if you wanted to look at this release schedule, I've provided the link to it at the bottom of the screen as well. Now, because we flow those local area data out on a state by sector basis, we get questions all the time. Is the data for my state available? Yes or no? And if it's yes, what data are available? Have you guys released all the sectors for my state or just some of them? So we have a geographic area series release resources page on our Census Bureau Economic Census website. I have included the link to it here as well. On this page, we have information on what's been released in, form of, in the form of an Excel file and a file that shows what's coming in the next 30 days. But in between those two Excel files is the graphic that's over on the right-hand side. This hex map, if you will, allow users to go in and see what sectors have been released for their state. And as you can see, uh, this slide was updated as of the May 14th um, release. And as of May 14th, we had released data from about 63% of all of the data that's coming out as part of the economic census. Now, I'm happy to report that the data for Washington State started coming out right in January is one of our first states. Uh, we actually start on the, on the West Coast and sort of work our way toward the center and a little bit on the East Coast too. So you can see Washington was started pretty early. Now, one of the really nice features of this, of this tool is the links that we have provided inside this tool. So I'm gonna very quickly show you um, how those links work. So if I go to the Census Bureau's website, and I go to our economic census page, I will then come to our home page. And on the left-hand side, there's a link to our 2017 economic census release information. I click on that link. The application is then going to bring me out to the page that we were just looking at um, on my screenshots. 
Here is that visualization that I was talking about. You can see we're at about 63% according to the donut. Now, if I was interested in finding out data for the state of Washington, I could click on, put my cursor over Washington state, and what you see is a list of all of the sectors that have been released so far for the state of Washington. 14 of the 18 economic census sectors data have been released. The four that are not yet available are mining, construction, manufacturing, and management of companies and enterprises. Those four sectors will all be released right around that August timeframe. Now, as some of you have discovered, accessing our economic census data in the new data.census.gov platform can be challenging. So one of the nice features that we added here to this display is not only a list of the sectors that we've released, but also a deep link that lets you go right into data.census.gov. If I were to click on this click here link, it would bring me right into the tool. Now let's say I'm actually interested in the healthcare sector in Washington State. I can use this menu here at the top. I can choose healthcare. The map then refreshes and we can see that 86% of the healthcare data that we are publishing has been released. And now if I go to Washington State and click on this link here, the application is actually gonna bring me right out into data.census.gov already pre-filtered for Washington State, healthcare, and the table that displays shows the two, three, four, five, and six digits, the full NAICS detail for Washington State. Now, some of you may be saying, wow, that's really nice. It, it let me get right to that data without having to go through all the menus, but I don't care about Washington State as a whole. I want to look specifically at the data for King County or for Pierce County or for Snohomish County. How do I how do I do that? How would I change the default geography from Washington State to Kitsap County? The way I can do that is by using this geographies menu. When I go to geography, I can then go in and choose my county and then go through the normal menu process and now this map will actually refresh and show the data for King County or whichever county you select. So this is a really nice way to get to the data without having to sort of wade your way through all of those, um, all of those tools. Let me get back over to my PowerPoint file and talk a little bit more about the economic census. So when we do the economic census, there's a number of major changes that are typically reflected for the first time in the economic census. For all the annual programs that occur in between the economic census years, we baseline and benchmark those annual programs back to the previous economic census, and we sort of bundle up all of the changes over that five-year period and reflect them for the first time in the economic census. This slide provides some information about those changes. So the first change we're gonna talk about is geography change. As many of you know, the boundaries of counties and cities and even metro areas change on a regular basis. And we've got some resource materials that we're gonna talk about in a moment that help you understand and identify what those changes are so that when you're making time series comparisons between the 2012 and 2017 economic census, you can make those changes knowing fully well that the geography you are comparing is in fact comparable. Now, I wanna make a big point here. This comparability information is not only important for the economic census, but it's even important when you're looking, for, looking at data for other data sources, even non-government data sources. I never cease to be amazed when I talk to data users who are making a comparison about their local community over time and they're making a comparison uh, for, to maybe data from 10 years ago where the boundaries of their town have changed. Well, is all of the economic growth that they're about ready to highlight truly economic growth, or is it more a figment of the boundary change? The town, for example, that I live in here in Maryland, Crofton, Maryland, annexed, if you will, some land on the west side of the town when that annexation occurred, the only things that were physically located in that area were businesses. There were about 45 businesses that were in that part of the, of the area 
that had been there for years but were never included in the town of Crofton, Maryland. So as a function of that boundary change, we've now added 45 or so businesses and all of their employment and all of their wages uh, to the boundaries, to the data for Crofton, Maryland. So when you make a comparison, a large portion of the growth that has occurred in my town is a function of that boundary change. Now, as it turns out, there were no houses in that area. So while that boundary change is important to understand from an economic perspective, because there's no people that were living there, that boundary change essentially had no impact on the demographic data that we published at the Census Bureau. So we have that type of information available. Now, along with those geographic changes we just talked about, I do want to highlight that we are not going to be publishing zip code data from the economic census anymore. And before you start crying and wondering, oh no, the zip code data was so great, uh, what am I going to do? Fear not, it's not as bad a deal as it is. We have had an annual program called Zip Code Business Patterns. It's sort of the, the child, the, um, the sister, brother, sister application or data tool uh, to our county business patterns program that still will continue publishing zip code level data. So fear not, there's really no major loss. The other geographic change though is a pretty big one. And that is that we are not gonna be publishing place level data for the manufacturing sector. And the single biggest reason is one of the, is the second to last bullet on this slide. Starting with the 2017 economic census and our other 2017 annual programs, the Census Bureau is implementing some brand new disclosure rules that are going to be impacting the data that we publish as part of the economic census and these other programs. Neil mentioned at the very start of the presentation the fact that the June presentation uh, that you all are going to be having is going to talk about differential privacy. We did not implement differential privacy in the economic census. However, we are implementing changes to our disclosure rules that are having a similar impact on the publishable data as differential privacy will have on the demographic data. So it's kind of the bummer portion of my presentation, but this is something that we are committed to, uh, and that is protecting the privacy of businesses. Now, along with geography, the NAICS classification system, the North American Industry Classification System, changes every five years. And there's some important changes here too. I'll quickly talk about those. And then finally, very briefly, we'll talk about the new NAPS system, the North American Product Classification System. So let's talk about geography. Um, when you think about the geographies that are in the state of Washington, uh, we publish data at the metro, county, city, um, and town type levels. Between 2012 and 2017, there were no metropolitan area changes. So that means that making comparison for the Seattle metro from 2012 to 2017 is completely comparable. However, 277 of the economic places that we publish in the economic census had some type of change. 156 of them had area gain. They annexed some neighboring land, they gained some area, their boundaries have changed. 112 of them lost area. There were no places in Washington that had a name change, but in many states that is true. And there were nine brand new places that we are recognizing for the very first time. If you look over on the right-hand side of the slide, I've included a screenshot of our geo changes page that shows what are those nine areas that now qualify because of, they, because of economic growth or because of demographic growth. These are areas where their population perhaps was below 2,500 for the 2012 economic census, but now it's grown enough that it's above 2,500. So those nine places, uh, Shadow Lake, uh, Navy Yard City, uh, Brewster City, et cetera. These are all uh, areas that did not qualify for separate publication in the economic census in 2012 and now do. There were, however, seven places that we dropped that did qualify in 2012 and now have shed population and now have shrunk to the point that they don't separately qualify. 
Again, as I mentioned before, the businesses that are located in Kingsgate CDP, for example, are still published. The data are still included, but they're now published in something called the balance of county, in this case, the balance of King County. Now, what I've included here is just a very high level summary of these geographic changes. If you want to learn more, and I would very, very much encourage you all to bookmark this page, I have included a link to our geographies page on the Economic Census website where you can go in and look at what are those 156 places that had area gain, what are the 112 that had area lost. Now, that geographies resources page provides this information in a tabular type format like we're seeing on the right, but we also have a map-based display of that information called Tiger Web Econ. The link to, the, to this is on the bottom of the page um, on, this, on this particular slide. Now, one thing I want to highlight to you all is that users often think that these geographies, these areas that have gained area or lost area, primarily are small towns. And that is not true. Seattle was one of the cities that gained area between 2012 and 2017, and Tacoma, Washington was one of the areas that lost area. So if I was comparing data between 2012 and 2017 for Tacoma, Washington, and I didn't check first to see what was that area that it lost, are there businesses and people that live in that area that are now not counted as part of that particular city, part of the city of Tacoma, I'd want to keep that in mind. So it's a very sort of important note. When you're comparing something, make sure what you're comparing is comparable. Now, in addition to geography change, we also have the changes to the North American Industry Classification System. NAICS is updated every five years on the years ending with two and seven. This is a very simple slide just talking about sort of the history of NAICS, who owns it, um, who developed it, et cetera. The next two slides give you a summary of the changes that have occurred between 2012 and 2017. And those changes are limited to six sectors. Three of them are on this slide, mining, manufacturing, and retail trade. And as you can see, there's a couple of different types of changes that have occurred. We have combinations. For example, if you look over on the right-hand side, we used to publish data in 2012 specifically for household cooking appliance, household refrigerators, household laundry equipment, and other major household appliance manufacturing. If any of you have gone shopping recently for an appliance, uh, our refrigerator decided to die a couple of weeks ago, and in frustration, I said, oh, the heck with it, and I went out, and instead of fixing it for the third time, we went out and bought a brand new refrigerator. Um, if you look at the label on those refrigerators at Home Depot and Lowe's, and the other appliance stores, uh, you'll notice that very, very few of them are made in the United States. Um, because of that decline in appliance manufacturing in the United States, we have now combined these four separate NAICS codes into one brand new NAICS code called Major Household Appliance Manufacturing. Similarly, on the retail sector, you can see that we've combined the NAICS codes for electronic shopping, electronic auctions, and mail order houses have now also been combined into a code for electronic shopping and mail order houses. Again, the reason why you normally have these combinations is that because of industry decline or because of industry consolidation. The industry may not be shrinking, it's just that the number of companies in that industry has consolidated. So we can't publish the data because of there's so few players. The blue highlighted cases are cases where it was simply a recode. We published data using one code in 2012, and now it's a different code in 2017. You can see under retail trade, all other general merchandise stores, same exact description, same exact content, different code. So when you're using data for these cases, you, you would then know, yes, the data are comparable, but the code is now different. I just need to look for the data under a different code. The peach sort of um, cases are many to many cases cases where pieces of industries were pulled out and moved into other industries. So for example, under retail trade, you can see that we have always had codes for discount department stores and warehouse clubs and super centers. However, 
we realized that discount department stores that have an insignificant amount of perishable goods uh, grocery sales are still called department stores. But those discount department stores that have a significant perishable grocery sales, those guys really are more like a warehouse club. So those particular businesses that were classified in the discount department store um, industry but had significant perishable grocery sales, they have now been actually recoded. They've been moved into, into a new code for warehouse clubs and super centers. Now, one very important point I want to make here is you notice that the title of both of these industries, of warehouse clubs and super centers, is exactly the same title in 2012 and in 2017. Just because the title is the same doesn't mean that the content is the same. So looking at looking at these resources is very important. Um, I have included a link to our NAICS website where you can learn even more details about these. And these are the last three sectors uh, that were impacted in 2017 NAICS. The information sector, a very important sector in Washington State, of course, um, had some changes here as well. Real estate and rental and leasing uh, were all recodes. And finally, in the professional scientific and technical services sector, we have the only truly brand new industry code in 2017. Research and development in nanotechnology has now grown enough that it's been broken out of the biotech R&D industry and the R&D in physical engineering and life sciences industry, except biotech. Nanotechnology now has its own industry. So I'm pretty certain that industry is, um, is strong in Washington state. Now, to get to all of this great data, these are three of the data tools uh, that have this information available. Uh, we're going to be providing a little bit of information about data.census.gov uh, later on. Linda's going to be talking about that, and I'll be doing a quick demo of Census Business Builder. Version 3.0 is what I'm going to be demoing for you uh, today. Version 3.1 will be released in August, and that's where you'll be able to start accessing the 2017 economic census data. Now, when we're releasing data, we also want to put it out in sort of fun ways. We do a lot of announcements in social media at the Census Bureau about our different programs and our data products. And one of the things we decided to do is create these fun facts. Um, there's one or more for each state in the nation that highlight a key sector in that state. Now, I would love to take credit for leveraging the 50 state quarter program to come up with uh, for these fun facts. I cannot accept that uh, because one of my other colleagues actually came up with this idea. My idea was to put the state flag there. Um, I really love the Washington quarter. Um, and as you can see, we're highlighting the data for the information sector in Washington state. Um, this is a sector that I think um, in Washington state has the highest average annual payroll per employment of any state in the nation. On average, the 3,864 information sector businesses in Washington pay their employees on average, $161,569. That's a pretty astounding average across all the employees in that, in that sector. Now, if you want to see the other visualizations that we have done, these other fun facts, I've provided a link to those visualizations in the bottom right-hand corner. And we even have a website called America Counts, where we get to write really sort of fun and cool stories um, about the U.S. economy and about our business and demographic data that we publish at Census. I've had the pleasure of writing a couple of them. Uh, one that really got a lot of traction uh, was on the trucking industry. Uh, but the story in the upper right-hand corner features these fun facts, and it helps us talk about how the economic census measures America's changing economy. So let's get into some data. Um, and just want to provide a couple of slides here featuring some statistics of what we've already released for the state of Washington. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see some data on the revenue for all the sectors that we have published so far. And you can clearly see that in Washington state, the wholesale trade and retail trade sector are very close, one, two ranked. Um, in terms of the one that we published so far. Now, you will notice that there are three sectors on that slide on the left that say NA. 
we don't publish revenue data by state for the utility sector, for information, and for financial insurance. The data are available for the more detailed NAICS breakouts, but not at the two-digit NAICS total. So I think if we were to look at the information sector of Washington State and their revenue, for specific industries within the information sector, we might see a slightly different bar chart, but this is just looking at the data for the two-digit NAICS. You'll also notice that there are four sectors that are not shown at all, mining, construction, manufacturing, and the management of companies and enterprises. Those are those four sectors that we haven't yet released. Now, it was interesting when I was looking at the data, when I compared the information between 2012 and 2017, to note that the retail trade sector actually had the largest growth of all of those published sectors between 2012 and 2017. Wholesale grew a lot, but nowhere near the $41 billion increase that the retail trade sector. And I will tell you that this is not that common. In most states that we have published data for, wholesale trade saw the biggest increase between 2012 and 2017. So when I saw that big increase in retail data, I was really curious to see, well, I wonder what sectors within retail trade have seen this, are showing this, in, this big increase. So this slide now looks at the three-digit NAICS breakouts, not just the two-digit retail total, but the more detailed three-digit NAICS breakouts that we published for Washington State. So you can see motor vehicle and parts dealers had a pretty good increase from about $16 billion to about $24 billion between 2012 and 2017. But off to the right-hand side, non-store retailers clearly was the big increase um, in this particular, um, in Washington state. In that one particular five-year period, 2012 to 2017, non-store retailers, which is the wonderful term that we use to, to talk about online shopping, uh, went from about $37 billion to $63 billion. Now, being a curious data nerd myself, I was curious to see, well, what counties in Washington state have seen that big increase in non-store retailers? So this slide is now looking at retail trade total sales. And as you can see, King County accounted for the largest share of increase in retail sales in Washington County, in, excuse me, in Washington state. There, on the right-hand side, there were four counties that actually saw a decline in retail sales. Um, I was sort of interested in finding out, and you guys probably know this, what's going on here, why Lincoln County saw a $33 million decline. But clearly, King County made up the biggest share of that increase. Um, and it's interesting to note that the four um, Puget Sound Regional Council counties, those four counties, King, Pierce, Nohomish, and Kitsap County, accounted for 84% of the retail sales increase between 2012 and 2017. Now, my colleague Heidi reminded me that those four counties are also where the largest share of the population in Washington state live, but I suspect that that increase in sales is actually above and beyond what the population share is, because I suspect a lot of people buy products from companies that are based in King County, Pierce County, Snohomish County, and Kitsap County, um, and have them shipped all over the country. Um, we probably all know who I'm talking about. Of course, I can't say it because I'm a census employee, and I'd go to jail if I violated the privacy of those companies. Uh, but this is just a kind of a quick view of some of the types of analysis that you can do using the data that we publish in the economic census. Now, once we have completed releasing these local area data releases, we'll then move on to release those MAPS products, the North American Product Classification Data. The product line data in the past has been scattered across a variety of different programs and, and data products, so it made it very difficult for users to compare the product lines across the mining and manufacturing sector, the construction sector, and every other sector. Those three major groupings of industry sectors all publish their product line data in a very different way. 
Under the NAP system, all of these product lines have now been consolidated into one consistent tabular structure that will now make it much, much easier for people to understand the product data across sectors. So for example, let's just pretend you were interested in shoes and you wanted to look at data for shoe manufacturers to wholesalers, shoe retailers, also called shoe stores, and shoe repair facilities. Those four different breakouts previously would have been published in four completely separate tables. Now the, the product lines for those four industries will all be together into one big consolidated report. Similarly, we are consolidating the establishment and firm size reports. Historically, if people wanted data on small manufacturers and small retailers, they would have had to go to two different tables, uh, two, two different tables broken out by sector. Now they're all been consolidated together. So you can look at those uh, employment size tables in one place. And then finally, we have some changes to our miscellaneous subex tables, including some further consolidation there as well. Now, if you're interested in sort of getting a preview of what these new NAPS products are gonna look like when they get released in November of this year. I have provided a link in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide to our NAPS website, where you can go in and look at the concordance tables and the previews and things that they have there. So you can kind of see what's coming. So to summarize uh, for you all, I just want to mention again, um, repeat that this economic census provides an amazing wealth of business data. Um, even after 33 years of the Census Bureau, I still find out about cool things that we publish as part of the academic census. It's why I've had a nice chance to write some of these American account stories is just digging into the data and seeing just really sort of interesting things that are in there. Because it's our big program, it takes us a while to get all the data out. They are released on a flow basis. So to learn more, I really encourage you all to check out that release page. Um, I've given you the link here again. For those of you who are doing time series comparisons, whether it's from Census Bureau data or using data from other sources, please, please, please use our geographic change comparability information to ensure that the data you are comparing is in fact comparable. These geography changes apply to every data product that should be out there. Um, so I would encourage you all to check those out. And again, for those of you who are using data on the makes basis, before you make comparisons of industries over time and before you're pulling the data, I would encourage you all to check out that makes website to be able to learn more about that. So these data are also being released on data.gov. My colleague Linda will be talking a little bit about that in just a moment. And of course, we have some more data coming. So with that, I am actually done. And it looks like I did okay on my time. I want to see, does anybody have any questions? So it looks like um, Kristen posted, we're taking some questions, or we'll see if anybody's got questions through the chat. Okay. So while we're waiting to see if anybody does have any questions, maybe I will bring up one or two of the things that I typically get questions on, Heidi. Um, so very often people will ask me, Andy, does census have data on nonprofits? Um, a lot of users are interested in looking at the importance of nonprofit businesses in certain sectors of their local economies, and they want to know if we have data that covers nonprofit businesses. The short answer to that, uh, to that question is no, we don't actually publish data on profit, nonprofit, but the longer answer is actually a good answer, um, and that is that yes, we do have data on tax status. For eight of the 18 sectors that we publish in the economic census, we break out the data for businesses that are subject to federal income tax and those that are exempt from federal income tax. And what I tell people is, while it's not a perfect proxy, tax status is a reasonable proxy for profit, nonprofit status. Most nonprofit businesses are exempt from federal income tax, and most for profit businesses are subject to federal income tax. There are nonprofits that are subject to federal income tax, sort of the opposite. 
but it's not that common. So the tax status data is actually a reasonably good proxy to use for uh, profit, nonprofit um, data. And as I said, we published that breakout in the eight sectors where nonprofits are very common. So for example, in the healthcare sector, you would be able to look at data on for-profit hospitals as well as nonprofit hospitals by looking at the tax status data for hospitals. Um, same thing for doctor's offices and clinics and a variety of other healthcare businesses. In the finance and insurance sector, you have sort of financial advisors that work with uh, the poor, poor folks uh, that are often nonprofit uh, financial advice type businesses providing services for um, people who have you know some challenges. Uh, those data are available for profit and nonprofit again using the tax status data. So that's that's a very common question uh, that I get. Are there any other questions? Andy, we do have a question that has come in. Sure. Um, can you can you please elaborate more on why manufacturing data is being suppressed? at the place city level. I work in a city where manufacturing is the main driver of economic activity. Right. So, okay, so um, as I alluded to, the data that we publish at the Census Bureau is subject to privacy protections. Um, historically, we have always followed a disclosure, a, a privacy rule, that allowed us to publish the number of businesses even when we had to suppress the data on employment and payroll and sales. Um, and essentially that was because anyone could drive down the street and see the one grocery store in a particular town or the one manufacturer in a particular town. But starting for the 2017 economic census and our other 2017 economic programs, we are now being required to follow some new disclosure rules that the Internal Revenue Service has issued as part of their IRS Pub 1075 rule. So it's a brand new, relatively new rule that we are now being forced to, to abide by. And essentially that rule is now saying that any time the number of establishments in an industry in a geography is three or fewer, or any time where the employment and payroll and sales data were suppressed for our own regular rules, we now need to suppress that entire row of data. And when we did the analysis in the manufacturing sector, there were so many, such a large portion, over 80% of the cities and towns in the United States where we would have had this completely suppressed the manufacturing data in that particular uh, town because of this new rule that we just decided in the end to not try to publish it at all. Because what that would have meant is you would have ended up with cities like Los Angeles and Seattle and, and other really big cities that would have had manufacturing data published because there's enough manufacturers in that city or town uh, to allow us to publish the data where the vast majority of the rest of Washington state would get no manufacturing data. Uh, the person who asked that question said that manufacturing is a key industry in their, in their particular town. Um, I suspect that what they're talking about is there's probably one or maybe a relatively small number of large manufacturers that account for the, the lion's share of the workforce in their towns. In that case, we would have had to suppress the data for that. So even though we would have published it, it would have been all D in the table. And unfortunately, that's what's happened. Uh, a similar impact is going to occur under differential privacy. I know um, one of my colleagues from Census is going to be giving the presentation in June about differential privacy and how it's going to impact the data published in the decennial census for small uh, categories. Um, that it'll have the same sort of impact. We are working on a plan for the 2022 economic census that will hopefully restore some of the suppressed data that we had to suppress for 2017. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing we could do about it right now. 
The only solution I would say is those suppressions aren't going to impact the county level data quite as much. I know that doesn't really help um, small communities who need data for their town, not just for the entire county. And as I mentioned, we do have zip code data. It's just counts of businesses, though. You're not going to get the employment and payroll and sales data, and you will even notice some suppressions in the zip code data files as well. So it's just sort of one of the costs of us doing uh, surveys where we are so committed to the privacy of the businesses that respond to our programs. So I'm sorry. It's a, uh, as you can tell from my from my tone, it really bums me out too. When I first learned that this was happening, I was like, oh my goodness, this is really unfortunate. But it is it is what it is. Uh, that was the only question I come in. We had a, a handful of thank yous, and that this was a really helpful presentation. So I wanted to make sure that pass that along to you, Andy. Great, thank you. So I guess we're now ready to take um, our break. Uh, my colleague um, Linda Lee will be coming back on in about five minutes or so from now. So thank you all so much for hearing me out and you'll hear me in about an hour. Neil, I show 10 after, should we begin? Yes, let's go ahead. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna have our next speaker, uh, Linda Lee, who will be talking about new business programs and data resources. Hi, thank you, Heidi. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen that I'm sharing. Yes, Linda, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Linda Lee, and I'd like to thank everyone for your interest in today's session on the Census Bureau's new business programs and data resources. As Andy had mentioned, today we will be covering several programs and resources that are timely and that it can help you guide in your business decision making. So let's take a look at the specifics of today's workshop. Today, we are featuring information on the business formation statistics and the Pulse survey, both of which are available on a weekly basis. I hope you find this as exciting as I do. I've been working with the Census Bureau for over 10 years, and prior to these efforts, the closest to real-time data we offered were from monthly surveys. Then, we will take a look at the annual business survey, which had its initial release of data yesterday on May the 19th. Now, in addition to these new programs, we also have new resources to help you find the data that you need in order to make an informed business decision. Specifically, with the environment that we are all living in, the Census Bureau responded to the need for reliable data on this topic and created the COVID-19 Data Hub. This is a central location for you when it comes to finding data related to the impact of COVID-19 on your community. And for anyone who has not been on our site for a while, I've included information on our new data dissemination platform that Andy had mentioned earlier in the first session. And before we move along, I also want to point out that the right side of the slide are links that will lead you directly to these programs that I mentioned. So the business formation statistics is also, also commonly referred to as a BFS. It is a new data product that's related that um, was created out of a joint collaboration with economists from affiliated with the Board of Governors for the Federal Reserve System, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the University of Maryland, and the University of Notre Dame. The BFS were created out of the need to analyze data on business startups with minimal lag periods. So other programs you may be familiar with are the business dynamic statistics offer similar data annually with a two-year lag period. And you also may be familiar with the quarterly workforce indicator, which provides statistics on job destruction and firm age, and that has a nine-month lag period. So prior to the BFS, data users obtain timely statistics with a seven-month lag from the business employment dynamics that is conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
The BFS was primarily was previously available on a quarterly basis at the national, state, and regional level. New this year, we began releasing the data on a weekly basis. And in the additional resources on this slide, the first link will lead you to an inter interesting article written by our economists who helped develop this program. Another good thing to know is that you can also access this data on the go if that's your preferred method to access data using the FRED mobile app. So what kind of data can you get from the BFS? The BFS can provide you with timely data on business applications, the actual and projected business formations, and the delay in business formation. The, the BFS contains four business application series and eight business formation series, with each of the series available both at the national and state levels. The data is also revised and updated as we receive new data and information. So here's a visual representation of the business application series that can help you decide which statistics is most appropriate for your needs. As you can see, the series is a subset of one another with the EIN application as the universe. The EIN application serves as our administrative data because not all the applications equate to an employer business. So I want to mention that the illustration is not drawn to scale. Therefore, some of the categories are not proportional. And as you can see, some may also overlap. And here's a deeper dive into the business application series. Listed on this slide are the descriptions of the four business applications series illustrated on the previous slide. The series contains statistics based on characteristics. So one of the first ones is the business application. These data, these data are a subset of the actual request for the federal employer identification number. The data includes only requests for EIN that are deemed to have the potential to eventually form into a business. Such being the case, business application data excludes items listed here, such as trust and certain entities. Another, another characteristic is the high propensity business application. Data from this series have been categorized, categorized as uh, business applications that have additional characteristics that make them more likely than other applicants to turn into businesses with payroll. And others in the series are business applications with planned wages and from corporations. One moment. All right, that was my um, personal phone. <laughs> Let's shift over and take a look at the business formation slide of the house. The formation series consists of eight in the series that describe employer business formations with statistics to include business applications that turn into businesses with payroll within four quarters from the time of application, or rather from the time of applying for the application. It also includes projected figures, vice formation, and the average duration from application to formation. This information is available to you in a four or an eight quarter time period making up the eight steps in the series. And at the bottom of the slide is a link that will take you to the site where you can find more details associated with the series. So this graph comes from our Center for Economic Studies and Research Data Center research report that was published last year in June of 2019. The graph provides a nice illustration of the business formation series described on the previous slide. The solid line represents the actual business formation with the dotted one providing information on projected formation for the nation. And this is not, this is our latest report. So um, the next report should be coming out sometime this summer. So let's take a look at the longitudinal data from the BFS. Depicted on this illustration are the number of business applications per 1,000 people for the selected years between 2006 and 2018. It appears that the number of applications per capita for new businesses have declined over this time period. 
And in, in addition to this, we also see that geographically, it appears that the number of applications per capita remain relatively high in Florida, while other states have varying patterns. This slide illustrates the business formation rate, which is defined as the number of businesses per high propensity application. The data we see here is an overall decline in actual business formation rate from 2006 to 2016. In 2018, we see that some states experienced an increase. What's interesting about this illustration is finding out about the regions where new businesses have formed by state and also by region. So if you're interested in reading more details um, about these two slides that we've just seen, the information can be found in the report, the 2018 Center for Economic Studies and Research Data Center's research report from June of 2019. So now that you've seen an overview of data from the BFS, let's take a look at what the weekly data looks like. The weekly data had its first release on April the 8th of this year. To get to the weekly data, when you are on the BFS site, there is a section where you can customize your data. So if you see circled in red, where you can select the application type, the state, and the date. And the orange arrow points you to an inset of all the options you have when you select the application type. In this illustration, I've selected business application for Washington State for the week, 19th week of 2020. And once you've selected, made all your selections, the map of the US and the bar graph will update with the criteria that you specified. Other neat tools that we have for you can be found under the data tab of the BFS main page. Let's take a look at the business formation statistics. You can access the BFS by simply visiting census.gov and searching for the program. I've included the link at the bottom here that will lead you directly to the main page for your convenience. On the main page, you have access to many resources about this program. And specifically, I'm going to show you on the next slide neat features that I mentioned earlier under the data tab. The data section of the BFS main page contains four sections. Here you have access to time series data, geographic visualizations, interactive graphs, and past releases. And we'll go briefly into these in, in a moment. So under the time series data, when you select time series and trend chart, you can create and customize your own time series. In the middle of the page, I've included an illustration of items you can choose in customizing your own time series. This is a, snap, this is a, um, a snapshot of um, what the page looks like when you go to our site. Although we are talking about the BFS today, when you have a moment to explore, I highly encourage you to check this out and play around with the tool. When you go to use this tool, you'll also be able, able to find other economic indicators that we did not touch on today under number one in the drop down menu, and you'll be able to create a lot of neat graphs. So, for instance, this is an example of results when you customize. In this case, I've selected business formation statistics as the survey. 2004 to 2020 for the time period. And I also wanted to know statistics on business applications and total applications for the state of Washington. And you have a choice, and in this case, I selected both seasonally adjusted and not adjusted data. And then I simply hit get data. And this table appears. The data is available in a table format by year and also by quarter. And geographic level is also available by Northeast, Midwest, South, and West regions. And from here, in the blue text, you can download the data in various formats, as well as create a bar graph or line graph.
And um, in the geographical visualization section, you can access interactive graphs. This section is updated with new data on the day of release, but not exactly at the same time as the release of the data. And on this slide, you can see that our interactive graphs are available at the national and state levels. And I'm going to show you one from state. And I've selected the interactive graph for the state for your, to show you data for Washington State. This graph shows that since 2010, although there have been quarterly dips here and there, overall business applications for the state of Washington have increased. So finally, under the data tab is a past releases section. When you select and open the past releases, you will obtain a summary report. And I've taken a snapshot of part of the report from the fourth quarter of the 2019 releases here. And the report is a nice way for you to quickly see trends and find, find high level summaries. So looking into the future, um, the BFS plans to correlate business application with local economic activity. And other future plans include providing additional series to what you've seen today. Some of these plans include collecting and publishing data at a more granular level and releasing data by a broad NAICS sector. Last year, weekly release was listed as a potential future series, and we've accomplished that this year. So I'm really looking forward to seeing more developments from this program. Let's move along to our next program. So here's another one of our newest innovation, the Small Business Pulse Survey. This survey was created as a means to track business changes during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I've also included links for you here to download the data or if you'd like to access frequently asked questions. And there's also an email address here for you to contact us if you have questions regarding this program. So what exactly is the Small Business Pulse Survey? So in partnership with the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the International Trade Administration, the Minority Business Development Administration and the Small Business Administration, the SBPS is a survey designed to collect data in order to better understand the impact of COVID-19. Data collection began on April 26th and will run through June 27th. It is a weekly survey conducted solely by email and it is released weekly. Um, the, data, the weekly data release began in mid-May. The type of data you can obtain from the SBPS are related to information on small business operations, finances, the challenges that they face, and their recovery expectations. It contains detailed information on small business specific initiatives such as the Paycheck Protection Program. The target population is all non-farm single location employer businesses with one to 499 employees and receipt of 1,000 or more in the 50 states, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. This is important to know because typically the Census Bureau does not define the term small business. Um, we provide different data dimensions such as employment and receipts, which we then allow our data users to self-define the term small business according to their research needs. This is the main page for the SBPS, and here's a screenshot of the list of data items you can obtain on small businesses from the SBPS. I really like this site a lot, I'll be honest. Um, I visited this site for the first time a few days ago um, in creating these slides, and I really like it a whole lot. I really encourage you to um, go on the site even if you um, were not interested in the COVID-19 data initially. It's a really cool site. 
So as you can see, you can find information on a wide array of items, such as the change in revenues, how uh, to how employees uh, employee hours have been affected to outlook on recovery on a weekly basis and you will be able to see the actual questions that was asked of our respondents as well and you can also compare that with results um, by the responses that we receive i'll show you in a moment <laughs> so here's an example of the data in this example the survey question is in the last week, did business, in temp did this business temporarily close any of its location for at least one day? The data is grouped by NAIC sector. And in the green box, you'll see the results for those who did answer yes. And in the orange box, the data for those who answered no. And the, this particular uh, question and data shows um, that the data show that more responded in the educational services, healthcare, and social assistance arts, entertainment, and recreation, and accommodation and food services represented on the graph by the NAIC sectors 61, 62, 71, and 72 respectively reported yes to temporarily closing as compared to those who reported no. And the percentage of businesses that temporarily closed during the week of April 26 to May 2nd were well above the national average for businesses in these sectors. So to download the Small Business Pulse survey data, from the survey's main page, you'll find a download tab. And as you can see, we are starting to release data. And as data becomes available, you'll be able to download a CSV file. Or you can um, also create the graphs like I just showed you on the earlier slides. let's move along to the annual business survey. Another new program that you may be interested in, it's fresh, hot off the press, the ABS released for the first time yesterday on May the 19th. And on this slide, I've uh, included resources for you again, um, where you can download the data. And also, if you'd like to read some more details, uh, we have provided technical documentations and there are related sites that you may want to visit as well. The annual business survey is a survey that includes both economic and demographic characteristics with data on business characteristics of the businesses and business owner characteristics such as sex, ethnicity, race, and veteran status. And a neat feature about this survey is that each year, the survey incorporates a module with a new set of questions, and we'll go more into this momentarily. And again, on the blues, on the right side of the slide, um, more resources for you. A little background on this program. Um, the ABS is sponsored by the National Science Foundation and it replaces three surveys that you may already be familiar with. ABS replaces the survey of business owners that Andy mentioned earlier um, which was conducted every five years in the years ending in two and seven. So if you need historical data on the latest SBO, it is available for 2012. Another survey that you may be familiar with now folded into the ABS is the Annual Survey of Entrepreneurs. The ASE collected similar data as the SBO. However, because it was conducted annually, it is not as detailed as the SBO and the latest ASE data is available from 2016. You can obtain the data in various formats for the ASE. You can um, obtain the data in Excel, CVS file, and also in PDF. And the third survey that the ABS includes is the Business R&D and Innovation Survey for Micro Businesses. So in looking at the ABS data, it's good to know that the survey is conducted on a firm or enterprise basis as opposed to an establishment level. 
Many of our programs are collected on an establishment level, so it's good to be aware, especially if you are looking across different programs to do certain types of comparisons. The survey includes all non-farm businesses and covers 20 NAICS industry with some exclusions. One of the exclusion is that it excludes non-employer businesses. Non-employer businesses are defined as those that do not report an employee. And this is an important distinction to know because a large portion of the businesses could be represented in non-employer statistics. A good example would be daycare operators or independent hairstylists. And this is the five-year content plan, so you can see the type of data you can look forward to. The release yesterday is the data for 2018. When you look across the years into the future, you can see that the survey has components that are collected every year, such as the business structure. And this is consistent throughout through all the five-year plan. But if you look towards the bottom of each of the years, you'll notice that these vary. This is the module that changes every year. So for instance, if you look at the bottom of 2018 data that was just released, um, 2018 has a finance component. And the 2019 data will include an, automa an automated technology module instead. And if you look um, in more into the future, you'll see that finance is included again in 2021. So there are opportunities to compare changes over time as new data are collected and released. And now let's switch gear and go into some of our new resources. Some of you may have already seen on census.gov that we have a COVID-19 data hub. This is a resource that has been designed to help federal agencies, businesses, and communities make decisions when it comes to things related to the pandemic. The site includes variables on demographic risk factors and the economic data on 20 key industries that have been impacted by the coronavirus. So when you are in the data hub, you'll be able to get visualizations and maps that you can download and share with others. For those of you who have not seen the page, the link on this slide leads you directly to the hub. Oh, and also I wanted to mention that um, during the Q&A, um, if you have questions on this, you're in luck. So my colleague, Andy, that uh, Andy, he, um, he's on the team who developed this site, so you'll be hearing from an expert. So when you arrive at the hub, you'll see that you have access to demographic and economic data at a glance. As we hear in the news, age can be a risk factor related to the COVID-19. So right away, you can see that we've included the number of population aged 65 years and older along with the total uninsured population. On the business side, we provided the total number of employer establishments as well as the total number of non-employer establishments. As you can see, there is a large number of businesses that report no employees. The at-a-glance data are at the national level, and you can certainly customize the geography to the area that you're interested in. The area in the red circle is where you can go and select a state and counties. In this example, I only selected Washington State without specifying a county. So as a result, um, circled in orange, it shows all the counties in Washington. And you, can, and you can use the arrow keys to go back and forth and you'll see data for each of the counties. This is the impact planning report shown slightly smaller on this previous slide. I've made it bigger here so you can see some of the data that you can obtain. Along the top, once you've customized your geography, instead of the national level data that you saw earlier, now you have key facts with demographic information for Washington State. The middle column has both economic and demographic data and the columns to the left and the right provide information on additional demographic statistics.
And this is a screenshot of the demographic and economic uh, interactive, interactive maps. In the upper left corner, you can specify an address or place, and the map will update based on your selection. This map is one of eight available, and um, you can access data on employer businesses, non-employer businesses, the percentage of household with income less than 75,000, the percentage of people below poverty, people age 65 and older, where the uninsured are located, language spoken at home, and where most of the socially vulnerable populations in the United States are located. I also want to mention that the legend circled here in red includes the source of the data. This is helpful if you have specific questions on the data you're looking at and you need to contact us. This information helps um, get, help us get you to the right program area immediately. So you probably already noticed that the upper right-hand corner, you can share this via email, Twitter, and Facebook. At the bottom of the COVID-19 Data Hub page, we have provided an option for you to do a categorical data set search. If you're looking for economic or business data, you'll want to use the business characteristics icon circled here in yellow. The business characteristics, I, I meant to say the economic characteristics that you see on the right to it is related to our demographic statistics. So if you like what you've seen today on the COVID-19 Data Hub, check out our site for additional information. We have data user resource where you can find what's new, what's coming soon, and we also have frequently asked questions. So as Andy mentioned earlier, um, this is the part where I go over data.census.gov. Um, it's going to be a very quick high overview of this. So I'm sure most of you today are probably aware that we have a new data dissemination platform called data.census.gov. And if you haven't done a data search on our site for some time, you'll find that the data.census.gov provides you with a search experience similar to popular search engines where you can just, um, you can do a search by putting, simply putting in a keyword in the search box where it says, I'm looking for search box. You can also do an advanced search if that's your preference. And here's a screenshot of the beginning of an advanced search. In this example, I chose to search by topic. And under topic, this is a list of possible topics. Choosing a topic then expands additional selections for you. And this allows you to specify and customize even further. If you're, and um, what Andy mentioned earlier about the economic census, you can come here and actually specify that you're looking for data from the economic census as well. And if you're interested in this data tool and would like more training, please visit our site, census.gov. Um, under the Census Academy section, we have many tutorial webinars posted for your reference. And at this time, I'd like to express my thanks to everyone for your interest in this workshop. I hope that you were able to pick up something new from this session. And before we begin our Q&A, please note on this slide that in addition to my own contact information, there is information on our data dissemination specialist that Heidi mentioned earlier. Our data dissemination specialists are assigned by geographic areas and would be able to help provide hands-on experience upon request. So uh, without further ado, um, let's begin our Q&A. Okay, so everyone, you can, uh, anybody that has a question can put it uh, in the chat. Or you can also type, I have a question, and Kristen will call on you, and you can do it over the phone as well, or your com computer. So 
so while we're waiting for questions, um, I just wanted to mention that um, I had mentioned that the ABS um, does not include non-employer statistics. Um, I, we've received some questions on this, and I have heard from our subject matter experts that although the ABS does not include non-employer statistics, um, the Census Bureau can produce demographic data for non-employers using administrative data. And currently, um, we are looking into um, working on a plan to produce additional data products that include non-employer statistics for, um, um, for the ABS. All right, Linda, looks like we might have one a question coming in. Okay. Yeah, uh, Mary, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask your question. So Linda, do you know who the data dissemination specialist is in the King County, uh, Washington area? Mary, so, it's me, Heidi, Heidi Crawford. <laughs> okay, it is Heidi. All right, thanks. And Linda, while we're waiting to see if any other questions come in, um, can you just talk about, have you all been getting, you know, some of the feedback that you have received on the, the COVID tool and um, what kind of suggestions are you getting for future enhancements? I guess Linda or Andy. So Andy is, um, is on the team who, de who developed, that developed the um, site. So he would be able to provide more information on that. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Andy. Okay, great. So, um, so great question, Heidi. So, the the COVID Hub um, initial release was on the 24th of April, and right away we received some feedback that led to version 2.0, um, which was just released last week. Um, the first piece of feedback that we got was. <clears throat> that we had previously not included information on the race, ethnicity, and gender of the population. Um, and it was primarily because when the COVID-19 pandemic started, race and ethnicity was not one of the risk factors that the CDC and HHS had identified as a potential um, you know, issue for COVID. And it wasn't until um, they started looking more at the people that were being impacted when they realized that there was actually a connection to race and ethnicity. So we added some data um, on race and ethnicity in that version. Um, also, as Linda, I believe, pointed out, the COVID hub not only includes demographic information about the people that live in, in, a, in a state and in a county, uh, but also some business data. Um, in the initial release, we only included data for employer businesses, uh, those businesses with paid employees that are published in the County Business Patterns Program. But we had a lot of feedback from users saying, um, what about self-employed people? Um, do you have any information that could help us look at potential impacts of businesses um, of self-employed persons? Uh, so the non-employer data was added as well. Um, in version 3.0, which is actually scheduled for a couple of weeks from now, we will be adding the business formation statistics data um, that Linda talked about, those, the data on business startups, um, because you can see such a huge impact on startups uh, that have happened and uh, since COVID happened. And of course, um, we will be adding the business pulse data um, in the fourth release of the tool. So I guess the point I'm, I'm sort of making is that as people are using this resource, we're getting feedback and we really are listening. We want to make sure that this resource is, is useful. Um, similarly, we also realized that there was some data that we don't have in the platform, but that people still wanted. Um, so we provided links to those other resources. So for example, the Johns Hopkins website, or the CDC page that has all the information on COVID cases and hospitalizations and deaths and things like that. 
those data we haven't incorporated into the hub, but they are linked to from the hub. Um, the last point that I want to make, and I think Linda may have mentioned this uh, in her summary, is that while the map, um, well, while the main dashboard, that first part of the hub, and while the interactive policy maps, the second portion, just show data at the state and county level, those maps, uh, the more detailed RAP maps, do allow users to drill down to census tracts. So if you wanted to look at the impacts of COVID-19 on population um, in the state of Washington, you can not only look at it at the, at the national and state and county levels, but you can then drill down further uh, to the census tracts in those really detailed data sets and, and even in the map layers. So for those of you who are GIS professionals and want to be able to incorporate those kinds of maps into your own tools, we've already prepped the data in ArcGIS to, to, to have it available as a layer that you can actually bring into your, into your products. So lots of stuff going on with it. It's sort of consumed my life over the last couple of weeks, probably eight weeks now, um, but uh, we hope that the, the tool is useful. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andy. And as, um, as Andy and Linda said, you know, please, if you haven't checked out this tool, please check out this tool because, uh, as Andy said, we are taking that feedback into consideration to enhance it for future versions. And I don't see any other questions. Uh, so before we, we end up having a little, breaking a little bit early, if there's anything else anybody would like to ask, our presenters will be on uh, at the end as well. So if you do think of something in, at the very end of the session before we sign off for the workshop for the day, you'll also have another chance. All right, I'm not seeing anything. So with that, uh, we are gonna have a third speaker joining us and to allow time for Erlene to be able to get on, we'll go ahead and just stick with the schedule so everybody will just have a little bit longer uh, coffee and stretch break. So we will start the next session at 11.10. So you have about 20 minutes to stretch and get that uh, fresh cup of coffee. All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started again here shortly. Andy, are you back on? Yep, I'm on. Okay, all right, great. All right, so uh, thanks, everyone, for continuing to hang with us. Hope you have a nice break. And we're going to go ahead and get started with our last session, which will be presented by, uh, we'll have Andy again and then also a new speaker that'll be joining us, um, Erlene Dow. And so go ahead, Andy, you can go ahead and get started. Great, super. So thank you very much, Heidi. Um, and thank you again for you all taking time out of your busy days uh, to attend this, these, these three webinars this morning. Um, again, my name is Andy Haight. I'm an economist at the Census Bureau. And in the third session, we're going to be talking about a couple of additional data tools um, in, in addition to the ones that Linda talked about in the previous session. Um, so I'm going to get started <clears throat> talking first about a data tool called Census Business Builder. Uh, some of you may be familiar uh, with this tool, but I am going to walk through the two editions of Census Business Builder and talk about some of the new features that were added in version 3.0. Um, and also talk a little bit about what's coming in the August release uh, for this for this year. Then my colleague, Erlene Dowell, uh, will be coming in. Uh, she's actually just closing out another webinar right now, uh, multitasking as, as we all have to do these days. Um, and she's going to be talking about two of our local employment dynamics programs, uh, PSEO, which stands for Post-Secondary Employment Outcomes, and VEO, which stands for Veterans Employment Outcomes. Um, these two programs are similar in that they look at information on earnings of people one, five, and 10 years out from a particular major event. So for PSEO, 
that major life event is graduation of college. And what PSEO does is it provides information on the earnings of students who graduated from college with a variety of degree programs. So you get to choose the degree program that you want to research. Um, and it then shows the earnings of those people at the one, five, and 10 year points out. Uh, PSEO right now um, is, covers four state university programs. Uh, unfortunately, Washington State is not in, included in that list. But the data are still really interesting when you look at degree programs for the four states that are shown. And I do happen to know that Washington State is in the list uh, to be added to PSEO. Uh, VEO is a program that is looking at information for veterans, uh, people who have left their military service and what their employment outcomes are at the one, five, and 10 year points after retirement, um, after their discharge from the military. And instead of looking at it by degree program, VEO looks at data based upon their specialty, uh, their occupation, if you will, as, as a military person. Um, and this is a brand new data product, uh, brand new data tool. Um, so I'm really uh, excited to see what Erlene has to say about that. So in my part of the presentation, uh, we're gonna be talking about a data tool called Census Business Builder. Um, as I'm sure you all know uh, by now from the sessions that we've done so far today and from your previous uh, work with census data, census has an amazing wealth of data. Even after 30 years working at the Census Bureau, I still am astounded um, by the detailed information that we have I spent my entire career working in our economic directorate, so I know our business surveys pretty well, but even on the business side, um, I still am just astounded by the kind of detailed information. Linda was talking about some of the data that's being uh, published as part of this new business um, uh, annual business survey program. Um, and she talked about these different modules that are being added each year. Seeing information on where small businesses get the money to start up their business um, is really sort of fascinating. And these days during COVID, I think there's a real connection there because when you think about some of the small businesses that have been able to do okay, um, survive, if you will, this COVID situation, some of those businesses survived because they already had established financial relationships with bankers in their local communities. So when they then had to apply for additional loans or for, or, or, or apply for PPP or CARES Act monies, um, they already had an established relationship with a bank. But those banks were more easily able to get the money to, the, to those businesses first. And we've probably all heard on the news how businesses, banks weren't actually able to get the money to businesses that didn't have an established relationship and how sort of unfortunate that is. Uh, these data actually show, can help show that. Um, understanding how many businesses started up by borrowing from grandma um, can give you some information about sort of what those vulnerable businesses are when they have a shock like COVID-19. So we have all this amazing wealth of data and if you're a data nerd, as some of you on the call may be today, uh, accessing these data in the various different data tools that we have on census.gov, including our brand new data.census.gov program, can be very fruitful. Um, the data tools are very powerful. You can access and, and download massive quantities of data. But if you're not one of those people, if you're one, someone who sort of has the need to know these data or a real sort of power user need, but doesn't necessarily have the power user ability to be able to wade through those kind of things. Sometimes this can be challenging. And that's basically who CBD was designed for. As you can see on the screen, there are two editions of Census Business Builder. The one we're going to spend most of the time on in my session is the one that's at the top, which is our regional analyst edition. This edition was designed specifically for chambers of commerce 
and other regional planning authorities like PSRC. Um, and what that tool allows businesses or these organizations to do is look at the demographics and the economics of the area that they serve. As most of you, I'm sure, know, many chambers of commerce and regional planning authorities are responsible for more than just a single city or a single county. They are regional chambers. Uh, PSRC, as I understand, covers four counties in Washington State, King, Kitsap, uh, Pierre, and Snohomish County. And I'm going to apologize if I butchered any of those uh, names. I've been to Washington State a couple of times for work, but I'm still kind of working on uh, on some of the names. Uh, so this tool was designed to provide demographic and business data for these regions. And what it does so well is it aggregates the demographic and business data that we have to that regional boundary. It lets the user create their own custom region and build that data. Um, just last year, um, Heidi and I had the chance to present out of the Puget, um, excuse me, out of the uh, Pacific Northwest Regional Economic Council uh, annual conference out in um, Seaside, Oregon, and we actually got to go and show them some of these data. And one of the things that they were really interested in was tsunami warning areas. They had identified census tracts or zip codes or counties that were potentially subject to tsunami war. Sorry, looks like I, I dropped the call from my phone. I don't know how that happened. So um, can you hear me again, Heidi? Yes, yes, thank you, Andy. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So um, where, did I, where did I drop out? Was I just talking about the Regional Analyst Edition? Yes, and we heard you talking about that we were at Penrec last year and you were talking oh. about the tracks in the tsunami zone. Exactly. So um, this tool, uh, the Census Business Builder Regional Analyst Edition, would let users aggregate all of the coastal uh, zip codes, for example, or census tracks that are in that tsunami zone warning area and it would then aggregate that data and show how many people live in that area that would be potentially impacted if a tsunami uh, were to occur. So that's the addition we're gonna spend the, of the most of my time talking about. But the second addition, uh, which is the one below it, is what we call the small business edition. And as its name implies, it was originally designed primarily for entrepreneurs and small business owners to help them access the basic demographic and business data that they need when they're opening their business or when they're researching a business. So let's say I was interested in opening a daycare center and I needed information for my business plan or my loan application to be able to show that the customers uh, for my daycare center were, were in the area where I wanted to open it, that the demographics and socioeconomic characteristics of the people that live there align with sort of my business plan and that the competition, the other daycare centers that are already there uh, serving that population um, leave room for me to be able to fit, um, that there's an underserved need. Uh, so the Census Business Builder Small Business Edition was designed for, for those types of people. Um, in building these two tools, we had some guiding principles. Um, we, of course, wanted to make it easy to use and customer focus. So as we've been um, talking to folks about these tools, we've received a lot of feedback, and we've those that feedback has resulted in a lot of updates to Census Business Builder, including a few things that I'll mention today. Um, these two tools uh, not only provide access to Census Bureau data, but we had decided from the very beginning that we were going to include more than just Census Bureau data, and we'll actually see that in just a moment in the live demo. These two tools were built for us by Esri. Um, so we leveraged the relationship and investment that the Census Bureau already has with Esri uh, to build these two tools. But we are also leveraging our own investment that we've made in our application programming interface or an API. For those of you who consume a lot of Census Bureau data and are taking the time every single year to download the American Community Survey five-year estimates data when they are uh, released every December, 
um, what I would highly recommend is for you to please stop doing that. Uh, instead of downloading our data every year and having to go through that process every single year, simply build your platforms to consume the data on the fly from our API. That's exactly how Census Business Builder presents all the data, and you'll see in just a moment when we do a demo how sort of speedy um, that all is. Uh, these two tools uh, were the first cloud-hosted um, Census Bureau public-facing data tool, and we hosted these two tools on AWS West for one reason and really one reason alone, um, and that is speed. Um, if these were hosted on our own server farm, um, we would not be able to see the performance as we see in these tools. We know people have no patience to watch a map build for 30 seconds, uh, so we built it on here. And both of these tool tools that I'm going to show you are both available to you for free. I like to joke with uh, data users that nothing from the federal government is for free. It's just that you already paid for it. So if you've already paid for this, why are you not using it? So with that, I'm going to jump out of this PowerPoint file and go out to my live browser and actually give you a quick demo of Census Business Builder. So to get to Census Business Builder, we go to Explore Data, then Data Tools and Apps, and then from this menu, I'm happy that it begins with the letter C, uh, you click on Census Business Builder, and that'll bring you to the CBB homepage. Of course, I could have typed in Census Business Builder in the search box, or I could have Googled it, and that would have brought you here as well, but I wanted to take you in the, the hard way um, to show you how to, how to get to this page. On the CBB homepage are a number of things. First, we have the links to the two editions that I just showed you, the Small Business Edition here on the left, the Regional Analysts Edition here on the right. We also have some overview flyers. Um, often I'll print these off and bring them to meetings that I go to so people have something that they can take away that has some basic information about how to use the tool. But we also have more detailed instructional flyers. Even though we really try to make this application as user-friendly, intuitive um, as possible, we know that there are some sort of power user features. Uh, for example, the ability to upload your own data into Census Business Builder is sort of a power user feature. There's a flyer specifically on how to do that. We have some recorded webinars um, on this site as well. And then finally, we have the normal help at FAQs uh, just to let you know, both editions are mobile optimized, and that allows users to go in and actually view these two tools on their mobile device. Uh, we know a lot of entrepreneurs, for example, live on their mobile device, um, so having the small business edition available to them um, is, is great. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to launch the Regional Analyst Edition just to kind of show you what this tool does and to highlight some of the updates that we made in version 3.0, which was just released in January. Um, so when you first come into the Regional Analyst Edition, the very first thing it asks you to do is choose the location that is sort of the basis or the primary part of your area that you're interested in researching. Since I know uh, that uh, PSRC um, is uh, comprised of King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish County, I'm going to type in King here. And the application is going to bring me up all of the kings, uh, the counties, the cities, et cetera. Here's King County, Washington. I'm going to go ahead and choose that. And the application is now going to zoom me in on King County, Washington. So we've actually now zoomed in here. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see a little bit more of the surrounding area. And right away, uh, we can see uh, some data. So in King County, Washington, there are uh, about 2.1, almost 2.2 million people. We have this dashboard here in the bottom left-hand corner. And as I then click around on the map, I can then look at data for the neighboring geographies. So in Snohomish County, there's about 786,000 people. Um, over here in Chelan County, again, I apologize if I'm butchering, butchering the name here, about 75,000 people I live there. Um, in, boy, I'm not even going to try that one. Um, about 44,000 people there. Um, here in Pierce County, about 859,000 people. And then finally in Kitsap County, 
uh, we have uh, 262,000 people. So the tool immediately presides, presents us some data. In the dashboard, we have a comparison of that variable over time. So you can see the population in Kitsap County has risen a little bit, or actually gone down a little tiny bit, going from the 2008 to 13, or excuse me, 9 to 13 estimates and 14 to 18 uh, estimates. We also have a geographic hierarchy comparison that would compare, in this, in this case, Kitsap County to the state of Washington and to the nation. We don't show those comparisons for variables like total population because the U.S. bar would be so big, you'd never even see the Kitsap County bar. But we do have that available for things like median household income. So if you wanted to compare the Kitsap County median household income to the, to the household income for a neighboring, uh, for the nation and for the state, you would have that as well. And then you have these four additional variables that all can be completely customized. Um, at the very top of the application is a menu bar that lets me choose the sector I'm researching, the industry sector, the geography that I've chosen, the map variable, and the filter. So under the map variables menu, we have a wide variety of data. There's demographic information like population and age and race and ethnicity data. There's socioeconomic data like household income and educational attainment, disability status, employment status, et cetera. And we even have some housing related data on owner versus renter occupied housing units, house values, owner costs, things like that. These variables are all from the American Community Survey. Um, and we always try to include the most recent data that's available in the school. The second tab here is our business data. This is the number of employer businesses, how many businesses, what their employment, what their payroll is uh, by county. But we also have the non-employer business. Now, right now, we're looking at data for all sectors. But if I wanted to look at, let's say, the healthcare sector, in this particular area of the country. I could go in and choose healthcare from this menu, and it would then go in and show me the number of employer and non-employer businesses in the healthcare sector, what their employment, what their revenues are, et cetera. Last year, uh, we also added in data from the quarterly workforce indicators, um, excuse me, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics quarterly census of employment and wages. So when I was mentioning before that this includes not only data from the Census Bureau, but data from other sources as well, this is one of the additions that we made. We added the QCW data to CBB, and honestly, we added it for a couple of major reasons. The biggest one is the wages data. The Census Bureau does not publish comprehensive data by industry and by geography on employment and wages. We have employment and annual payroll, but annual payroll and weekly wages is not the same thing. So we have that data in here, again, at that request of FEMA, actually, who wanted to have the QCW data added. The QWI data that I just mentioned a moment ago, that I erroneously uh, mentioned a moment ago, is also available in here, and that gives you information on things like hires and separations and firm job game and firm job loss, et cetera. Now, this next tab here <clears throat> is information on consumer spending. ESRI every year tabulates detailed information on how much people spend on a variety of things. There's over 2,000 or 3,000 categories that they publish we picked about 160 of them out of their list, and we have that information here. So if you were researching how much the people spend on dining out, we have that data. But if you wanted to find out how much they spend on dining out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we have that in here as well. So we've put some of these variables in there. Um, my comment to you all that I made earlier about <clears throat> feedback, your feedback is extremely valuable and has been extremely valuable for this consumer spending data. We've doubled the number of consumer spending variables based upon the comments that we got from people. And then this last section over here, my variables, this is where you can upload your own data. So we have a number of use cases where people wanted to be able to upload their own statistics into Census Business Builder. The tool lets them, uh, lets them go ahead and, and do that as well. So 
those are the basic data variables that are here available in, in um, such as business builder. I am just going to go over here really quickly and change this over to the household income data, just so you can kind of see how the map refreshes. You can see that now in Kitsap County, um, there, the median household income is 89103 uh, whereas over here in King County, it's $120,828. That's the average household income uh, for, for that particular county. Now, one of the key features I mentioned to you all a moment ago about the Regional Analyst Edition is that it allows users to build their own custom region. So let's say I wanted to build a custom region of the four counties that make up the Pacific, um, the Puget Sound Regional Council. The way I would do that, I would click on this Edit Region button, and then one at a time, I would go ahead and choose each of the counties that I'm interested in adding to my region. So I want to add Snohomish County, add that to my region. I want to now click on Pierce County, or excuse me, Kitsap County. There we go, and add it to my region. And finally, I want to add um, out over here. I want to add it. That one. There we go, Pierce County. And add it to my region. Now, in our case, we built a simple four county region, was really simple. Um, if I um, yeah. Um, if I was trying to build a more complex region that had more than just four counties, clicking on them would be a pain. So we have added just last year the ability to build your region by drawing a rectangle, a circle, or a polygon, where you can go ahead and drop a pin and draw a circle and be able to be able to see that actual um, that actual breakout that way. So circle and polygon. In the January release, we added this feature here, and that is being able to build your region from an uploaded shape file. So let's say you've already built a file of all of the zip codes that border water here in Washington State, and you wanted to aggregate all of the data that we have in this tool for those zip codes that you selected. If you have a shape file, that identifies those zip codes, you can upload that shape file here, and that shape file will then automatically build the region just like I just built it here. Now, once I'm done building my region, I can now go over here and I can name that region. So I'm going to call it, surprise, surprise, PSRC. And when I'm done editing that region, it's now going to outline that entire region and now I can go in and I can create a region report. And what the region report is going to do is it's going to tabulate and aggregate all of the demographic and business data that we were just looking at in Census Business Builder in that menu. And it is going to create a, a cumulative total. At the very top of the report, there is a list of the four counties that we selected. And each of these is a deep is a link as well. I could click on that and it will bring up the report for King County. So if I wanted to see out of the total population in this four county area, how much of that population is in King County, I could go ahead and actually do that by looking at the individual reports for each of the components. Now, one point I want to make is in my situation here, in the situation we were working through, um, the four components were all counties. But let's say you wanted to build a region of a combination of counties and cities. Let's say you have a chamber of commerce that is made up of one particular county in, in, eastern, or in uh, eastern Washington, and then a couple of neighboring cities that ring that county. CBB does let you build your regions from combinations of geographies, not just one type of geography. So I could select that county, I could then change my geographies over to places, which we'll see in just a moment, and I can then build my region from those, from those cities. It will allow you to build the region of any of the five types of geography that are available in Census Business Builder, and we'll see that in just a moment. 
So after we have our cover sheet here, we can then see that there's about 4 million, uh, almost 4.1 million people that live in that four county area. 6.2% of them are under five years old. 13.1% uh, of them are 65 and over. All of these charts over here are fully interactive. So if I choose one of these other data variables, uh, it then refreshes. There's my demographic. Here's all that socioeconomic data, household income, educational attainment, disability status, et cetera. Here is my housing data. And then as I go down, I get in, start getting into the business data. So looking at this particular sector, um, in this particular four-county area, there's 112,000 employer businesses in that four-county region. And if I then scroll down a little bit further, I can see that there's 290,000 non-employer businesses. Those are those self-employed people. When you add up those two together, that's really the total number of businesses in that four-county area. So you have all of that type of data in here as well. Now, one thing I'll say about these reports is, let's say I have this report that I've built and I really like this and I want to share it with someone. I can copy this URL and send that URL to someone, and when they click on it, it'll bring them right back to this report exactly how I have left it, even down to the actual name, the PSRC that I named it, that is carried along over here with the, the name is actually saved up here in the URL. Now, not only can you bookmark and save the link to the report, but you can similarly bookmark and save the link to the map. We have a emergency management and preparedness page on census.gov. And every year during hurricane season, we create custom pages for every named hurricane in the United States. And last year, we started also doing other major events, fires, et cetera. In all of those pages that we have created, we've been putting links to Census Business Builder for all of the counties or all the areas that were impacted that, by that particular disaster. Um, FEMA actually is so um, enamored, if you will, with this tool that they actually declared Census Business Builder a mission critical application to them and asked the Department of Commerce to declare it mission critical as well so that they would be assured that it would always be up during disasters. So I was extraordinarily proud. This is sort of my baby, um, if you will. Um, and I was really happy that they did that. Now, so far, we've just been looking at data at the county level. And you may be saying, okay, well, this is all well and good, but I now wanna be able to get in and I wanna look at some more detailed data. Census Business Builder presents information not only at the state and county level, but also by city, by zip code, and even by census tract. So if I wanna go in here and I wanna zoom in on this particular county, and I wanna start looking at the cities or the zip codes or the tracts within a particular county, when I zoom in, I can now look at city level data or zip code level data. So clicking on zip code, this is now gonna be looking at average income for every zip code in this area. Now, you just notice I had to zoom in a little bit of a way to get into where I could see the zip code level data, but now the rest of the, the four county area has sort of gone off the page. In the August release, we are going to be expanding the tool to allow users to see more geographies on the map at the same time, and that will allow you to be able to look at all four counties and be able to drill down to the cities and the zip codes. We probably still will need you to drill in uh, zoom in to be able to see the track level data, because as you can imagine, there's so many tracks in the US that we would actually probably crash our API server if we let you drill down and see all of them. Uh, but you will be able to see certainly more of them. Another feature uh, that we have in Census Business Builder in both editions is the filter. So let's say I'm interested in finding all of the zip codes on this map in this um, Puget Sound Regional Council that have certain characteristics. Let's say I want to find all of the geographies, all the zip codes that are high income 
but I also want to find the ones that have a high percentage of people who are disabled or some other characteristic. The way I would do that is by using the filter, and I can add a filter. So let's say I want to find disability status as my filter criteria. I'm going to choose percent disabled. And once I then select that variable, the application is now going to give me a range. So on this map, the percent disabled runs between three and a half and 51.4%. So let's say I wanted to find all the zip codes where at least 25% of the population are disabled. I can either drag the slider bar or I can enter the values manually. So let's say in my situation, I wanted to do 25%. Once I then apply that filter, the application is now gonna show only those zip codes that meet my criteria. And you can see, boy, I really trimmed out nearly everything. There's one zip code over here that has a high percentage of people who are disabled. That is zip code, see here, 98134. And then there's another zip code way out here in the eastern portion of the county um, that is zip code 98224. I can filter on up to six uh, filter criteria at the same time, and I can then download all the data of those uh, zip codes or whatever that meet my criteria. So that's a very simple sort of summary of, of the main features of Census Business Builder. I know my colleague Erlene um, is on the call uh, now, so I wanna make sure I give her plenty of time to be able to do her uh, demos about PSEO and VEO. So Erlene, are you actually on? I can't hear you talking, Erlene. You may be, may be muted. Click star four. I've been uh, unmuted. Hello, everyone. There you Can go. Can you hear Erlene. me now? Okay. Okay. <laughs> let me um Just let me kidding. get out of here, Erlene. Let me uh, go in and stop sharing my screen, uh, so you can go in and actually share yours. Are you are you ready to get to start your part? Um. Yes. I just need to pull up my um, PowerPoint. Okay. Great. So while you're pulling that up and while you're setting it up to share your screen, I did just notice that a question uh, just came in um, from someone asking about uh, documentation, I think they were saying, for uh, Census Business Builder. Let me just pull that down there again. Um, yes. Um, so the question is, is there a help document for Census Business Builder? and how do updates to the Census Business Builder affect Save URL? So yes, there is help documentation. That website that I brought you to first where I said there's an overview flyer and other um, tutorial flyers, that type of information is all there as well as in the help and FAQs. Um, your second question, Mary, is actually a really, really good question. Um, and it's been something that we've had sort of struggled a little bit with with CBB. Um, with each subsequent update to CBB, we wanted to make sure that users who had saved their links before were not dead in the water, where their links stopped working. And that did cause us to actually do some custom development that would allow old links that were saved before to work in the new application. Um, and that's actually been the way it's set up to work. What I will say is if you create a link, let's just, let's just pretend you created a link a year ago when we had data for the 2017 American Community Survey in the tool. And now you click on that link that before used to show 2017 American Community Survey data, but today we've now updated the application to show 2018 data your link will now go to the latest data. It'll be updated automatically to 2018. For most users, we think that that's a positive, that's a good thing that it does that. For other users, we have heard people say, I wanted to be able to keep the old data. How can I go back to it? And right now, the short answer is you can't. 
uh, but we actually are working on a potential fix that would allow you to actually save the vintage of the data in the URL itself. So you could pull up last year's version of the PSRC region and this year's version of the, P version of the PSRC region and be able to compare them side by side. Um, so that's a great question. Um, let me now turn it over to Erlene, uh, so she gets as much time as she has to walk through the two really cool things uh, that she wants to talk about. So thank you, Erlene. Thanks, Andy. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So thank you to Heidi and Andy for allowing me to be a part of the Puget Sound Regional Council Conference. My name is Erlene Dowell, and I am a program analyst at the Census Bureau specializing in the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics, or LEHD, program. Today, I will be showcasing two of our latest data tools, the Post-Secondary Employment Outcomes, or PSEO, Explorer, and the Veterans Employment Outcomes, or VEO, Explorer. Unlike the American Community Survey and the Economic Census, the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program is not dependent on survey responders. LEHD is, unique, is a unique link between employer and employee data for the U.S. Of course, you cannot talk about LEHD with, without talking about the Local Employment Dynamics, or LE, LED, which is a voluntary federal-state partnership developed in the 1990s. Under the partnership, States send their unemployment insurance or UI wage records and their quarterly census of employment wage data or QCEW to us, which then is combined with censuses and surveys to create new dynamic information on workers to produce public use data products as well as microdata for research. The UI gives us job data and the QCEW gives us firm data and our person data comes from the censuses and surveys. Currently, LEHD has five different data sets with seven applications for easy access to these data sets. Each data set along with each data tool is unique in its own way. If you are curious about employment, hires, separations, turnovers, and earnings, you would look at our quarterly workforce indicators or QWI utilizing the QWI Explorer or the LED extraction tool. If you want to look at statistics on job mobility across state boundaries or industries or earning changes due to job changes, you would use our job to job or J to J flows data using the J to J Explorer. If you want to look at employment for detailed and customized geography, you would look at the LEHD origin destination employee statistics or LED or loads data using the on the map or the on the map for emergency management data tools. One of our newer data sets is the post-secondary employment outcomes or PSEO. This experimental data set reports earnings by institution, degree field, degree level, and graduation cohort for one, five, and 10 years after graduation and is accessible through the PSEO Explorer. The current release includes the University of Texas system, public institutions in Colorado, University of Michigan, and University of Wisconsin-Madison. Finally, we just released our new data set, Veterans Employment Outcomes, or VEO. This new experimental data set reports earnings and employment outcomes for U.S. Army veterans for one, five, and 10 years after discharge by military occupation, rank, demographics, industry, and geography of employment. This is also accessible through our VEO Explorer. PSEO is an experimental tabulation that highlights employment and earnings outcomes for college and university graduates. By matching university transcript data with national database of jobs, PSEO provides annual earnings of graduates in the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile and traces graduate movements from post-secondary institution, degree level, and degree major to employment by industry and geographical, geographic labor markets. 
Transcript data is provided to the Census Bureau by higher education systems and individual college and universities through data sharing agreements with the Census Bureau. Ohio and New York SUNY and SUNY will be released soon at the end of the summer. When the University of Texas system partnered with the U.S. Census Bureau, this was the first of its kind of calibration to create a data tool that provides a window into future earnings for college graduates through the early years of their careers, as well as loan debt that they may occur. This came at a time when the cost of college education continued to escalate and loan debt was skyrocketing to $1.4 trillion. Some question the value of higher education. This data tool shines a unique light on one's returns investment on a four-year degree for a graduate in the workforce. Students can compare majors, look at graduate programs to see how all this education translates into profitable careers. Here is a view of how much UT Austin graduates are making after one five and 10 years post-graduation. This is an example of business administration management and operation to psychology generic. As you can see in this example, the business degree is more feasible than the psychology degree by 30K in the 10th year. The PSEO Explorer can also tell where UT Austin graduates end of working one year post-graduation, end up at, after one year of post-graduation. Here we can see the 80% of students in business, psychology, and all other instructional programs stayed in Texas. Here, we see that after five years post-graduation, the percentage decreased by 5%, almost 1% per year. And then here, after 10 years, the number dropped to 73%. On this slide, we can see what industries UT graduates are going into after 10 years, still looking at business, psychology, and other. We can see that 21% go into professional, scientific, and technical services, 16% go into education, and 12% go into healthcare and social assistance. Out of those three industries, as I just mentioned, they all stayed in Texas. Still looking at the same majors of UT Austin graduates after 10 years, how many are employed? So you can see that um, there are about 72% still employed out of the three industries that we were looking at, at or the, the grade level the degree level. All right, so let's go live. The easiest way to get there um, would be is if you type in lehd.ces.census.gov, And that'll take you to the LEHD homepage. Once you're there, on the left-hand side, down under applications, it's about the fifth one down, you can see PSEO Explorer. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And what's coming up automatically as the default, this is um, Colorado, and we can see the, um, years postgraduate for baccalaureate for business administration, management and operation, and then we can see psychology general. So you see after one year, um, the earnings for a Colorado um, University degree of a bachelor's degree in business 
it's 41,379, while um, you can see 90,424 in 10 years. And then for psychology, uh, the general is, or the generic is 26,423 after one year, and then 54,378 after 10 years. So this is a good way for them to see um, what what degrees majors would probably be, bring home the more income. So let's go ahead and try to recreate the Texas example. So if I go up to the top, I'm gonna change the Colorado State um, to Texas. And as you can see, we have only one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, of the universities that are sending us data. And then here we are looking at the business and psychology, which was also in the example, but I'm also going to click on all instructional programs. And still again, we are looking at the one, five, and 10 year earnings postgraduate degree. And then I'm going to go up at the top on the left hand side and I'm going to change the data type to flows. And now we get this really cool bipartite chart. And um, this is actually giving us numbers. So you can see um, for all instructional programs, there's about 55,602 students um, in that program. And then you can see the flows into the different industries. But I'm going to go ahead and change the display to percent. So there at the very bottom where it says display, I'll change that to percent. And then now you can see um, all of the different industries as a percent. So then the other thing is um, that we looked at uh, was how they were going into um, different geographies. So I'm going to click on this um, earth here where it says destination flows. And then we can see um, how majority of them went into 22%, 74% stayed in Texas. And then this is for the one, five, and 10 years. So on the left hand side, I can change it to 10 years. And then we see that um, it changed just a little bit to 72%. And then it also lists um, some that went to the Pacific, Mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic, Mountain, East, Northern, Central, and so on. And then you can hover over the area and then it'll um, make the total stand out a little more. Okay, and then when you're doing this, um, we always have some easy things to um, learn more about how to use the data. And then we have the raw data that you can download, but here's um, tutorials. If you have questions, um, definitely email us um, regarding your questions. But uh, just to let you know, I know you're asking the question, what about Washington State? Uh, we are in discussion with uh, the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, um, also for Texas Higher Education Coordinate, Coordinating Board, Arizona Board of Regents, Indiana Commission of Higher Education, and Utah System of Higher Education. So um, if you would like information on how to partner with the LEHD to be in the PSEO, send me an email and I will put you in touch with um, some of our experts. So going back to the PowerPoint. So just released uh, on May 5th at the beginning of this month. Uh, in fact, I just finished a webinar on this new data set and um, rushed over to this webinar um, to um, talk about how this tool is um, one of our newer tools. So um, this is an introduction for the Veterans Employment Outcomes data set. 
the challenges faced by military veterans transitioning into the civilian labor force are a subject of, of ongoing concern to policymakers. These statistics are generated by linking veteran record provided by U.S. Army to national administrative data on jobs at the U.S. Census Bureau. Coverage of the data is all enlisted soldiers in the Army who completed their initial term of service and were discharged between 2000 and 2015. So there's about 650,000 veteran uh, information in this data set. Coverage includes Army veterans, labor market outcomes like PSEO for one, five, and 10 years after discharge by military occupation, rank, demographics, such as age, sex, race, ethnicity, education, industry, and geography of employment. Although VEO currently covers only Army veterans, these statistics could potentially be extended to other service branches. So here is a view of the veterans employment outcome for one year post discharge of earnings for the infantry and, and amphibious in the 25%, 50%, and 75 percentile. The 25, 50, and 75 percentiles are based on performance. Those who are higher performers would make more money and are classified in the 75 percentile for this chosen profession. Studies found that private sector earnings upon exit are generally highest for veterans who are employed in the electrical equipment repair and intelligence gathering operation while in military service. Here we can see cohorts from 2000 to 2007. On the left is the occupation for electronic instruments in the 75 percentile, and that's about 83,880, while those in operational intelligence earn 102,000 in the 75 percentile, 10 years after discharge. Here, we can look at 10 industries that veterans go into and their earnings per industry for those in the 50 percentile, one year after discharge for a timeline of 2000 to 2014. So here at the top, you can see is mining and then utilities and information. Those who worked in the mining industry from 2012 to 2013 peaked at 80,000 dollars, which makes sense because that's when North Dakota had an oil boom. Next was the utilities and information, then finance and insurance, whole trade, manufacturing, and construction all clustered together. Finally, on this slide, you can look at employment totals and 10 industries veterans went into post one year discharge. In 2000, employment was at its highest with retail trade and manufacturing at the top of the list. So let's go live to show you how this data tool works. So I'm here back at the PSEO and I'm just gonna go ahead and close out of that and go into the tab that we still had open for the longitudinal employer household dynamics. And here at the bottom of the applications is the VEO Explorer. So as I pull it up, um, infantry general and armor and amphibious are current, which is what we looked at in the first slide. And then I'm just going to go ahead and add another, I can add another occupation. So let's go ahead and um, scroll down and pick out air traffic control. I just find that kind of interesting because uh, they're in high demand. Well, maybe not now, but usually they're in high demand, but it's such a stressful job. Um, so now we can see the earnings for all three. And surprising enough, 
air traffic controllers app in the 75 percentile one year post discharge um, earn about 61,960 a year. But if I go ahead and click on years post discharge, we can look at five years, which is 81,000, and then 10 years after discharge, which is 91,000 for air traffic controller and um, armor and amphibious would be 68,000 and then 74,000 for those in the 75 percentile. We can also go ahead and click on earning and we can look at the count of veterans. So there in infantry, there is a lot of those in infantry um, that are employed and the, the, the median is almost at 30K while um, for air traffic controllers, those are less, like 687 after 10 years. You can also look at um, service characteristics. So the AFQT range, that's all about how they did in the um, their testing and their scores. Um, the higher you test, the higher performance you are, and then the higher paying jobs. Years of service, we can look at that. So still looking at the three different ones. This is after 20 years six to 19 years and zero to five years, and this is their earnings. So in 2000 um, to 2001, their earnings were under 50K. And then in 2008 to 2009 for, um, I'm not sure which one this one is, but this one peaked and then, and then so on. You can also look at demographics. So we can look at um, those for sex. And you can see that um, males usually are paid more than the females. But in the 50 percentile, they're almost the same. So if we look at 75 percentile, and maybe. 10 years after, it's still the same. So um, males are earning about 10,000 more than the females. And then we can look at the industries. And here we can see, you know, what we looked at earlier with mining, utilities, and information and finance and insurance. Same thing, um, everything is very intuitive with our data tools, but if you need help, definitely click on this help um, and then you can send an email. This has all of the raw data information if um, anyone is interested in that. So some takeaways, uh, are that even though we only covered two of the seven data tools that we have, these web-based analysis and the visualization tools provide accessibility to the data for a wide variety of users, needs, and levels of statistical expertise. Many of our stakeholders are more likely to use web-based tools than download and manipulate raw data files. Along those same lines, these types of applications ease users into sessions of data exploration. Exploring the data is an excellent way to learn the intricacies of the statistics and discover features that you might not have tested otherwise. Analysis tools also help to provide real world context for the data by enabling easy comparison over time, geography, and characteristics. This contextual perspective often comes about when playing with visualization of the data. Visualizations change the way we understand the statistics and lead directly to greater insights, which can lead to more relevant and impactful storytelling. 
We also use these data tools to promote our data partnership and products to all stakeholders and to expand understanding of our data throughout the federal statistical system. And last but certainly, certainly not least, we build these tools for our state partners. We value our voluntary partners and hope that these tools significantly improve access to LED data and help to streamline data processes in their state. So to sum it up, LEHD links existing business and jobs data to create sources of local detailed labor market information. Um, I've included some hyperlinks to the PSEO and VEO explorers. So in summary, um, CBV provides a wealth of demographic and business data that you can use to better understand the composition of our region. Uh, PSEO provides a measurement of degree level, earnings, and employment as tuition costs increase. And VEO provides an important predictor of earnings outcomes within the military so that veterans, military personnel, and policymakers can explore these stati statistics. Please help us to ensure the high quality of these data by promoting response to census surveys in your region. So thank you so much for your attention and uh, we are ready for your questions. We have our first question um, I, uh, from Mary saying, I saw a tutorial for the LED tool, right? I'm sorry, was that the question? It was, the, yep, that was the question. So there is the tutorial there for the LED tool. Yes, yes. And now we're just waiting to see if any other questions come in. And everyone, please feel free to contact me. Um, I know I went fast. I wasn't sure what my time was and how long um, the session was. Um, but please feel free to email me and I will give you a one-on-one -on -one, um, tutorial if you need. Um, and then, you know, we can look at all of the other data sets that we have too. I know that Washington State loves our data tools. Um, we have so many examples that come out of Washington. Um, for example, Zillow did a study using their data and our data um, to look at the growth. Um, in the area that they have their headquarters. They looked at Amazon, um, Facebook, and then Redfin also used our data in Washington state. So lots of people in Washington like our data. Um, so just we have a comment says great presentation and also to please provide links to all PowerPoints. So this is Kristen with PSRC. Uh, I'll work with all the presenters to get their PowerPoints and we'll share those out uh, in the next couple days. And then Andy, I was wondering, and I saw, I'm sorry if I missed this in your presentation, but in terms of Census Business Builder um, future enhancements, what are you all looking for that and when would that be coming out? So, feature enhancements to CVB um, are in a couple of categories. Um, every every year when we do updates, we um, just we update the vintage of the data that's in the tool. That's just sort of a standard thing. We always want to make sure we have the latest QWI data, the latest QCW data, et cetera. Um, we also typically add in some new data in each with each subsequent release. I mentioned how we added the QCW data just this past year. Uh, this year we are planning on on adding the economic census 2017 uh, data that's not in the tool right now and we're also planning on adding some of those brand new programs that Linda was talking about. So uh, business formation statistics, um, the uh, pulse survey data we're planning on adding to CBB. Um, we have had some requests from other um, federal agencies to add some of their data and some of their other data services. So, for example, one feature I didn't talk about in CBB, just at the time, was we have a reference layers feature where you can overlay 
uh, reference layers on top of the data. They don't actually interact with the data, but at least it's displayed there for reference purposes. Um, USGS is very interested in overlaying some of their topographic layers and other flood, flood inundation map boundaries and things like that. I suspect that some of those may be of interest to folks in Washington state. Um, so we've been working with USGS to get their reference layers already queued up um, in a library that we have in CBB to put those in there. Um, naturally, we are always um, dealing with bug fixes. Um, so periodically we've had users that said, Andy, I tried to do something and it didn't work. Um, so we have some of those things. Uh, when we added the brand new ability to upload your own shape file um, that actually builds a region for you, uh, we had some users who were trying to upload shape files whose boundaries didn't match ours. So their vintage, for example, of, of, of a city boundary didn't match um, our boundaries, um, and the upload failed. Um, and it sort of failed ungratefully. So we want to add some messaging to tell users that the files that you upload have to align with Census Bureau boundaries. Um, otherwise, it won't work. Um, just to kind of make that a little bit more of a graceful kind of a thing. Um, and I and I will also mention um, we've had some interest in building an edition of CBB that's like the regional analyst edition, but instead of creating geographic clusters, lets you create industry clusters. Um, so that's uh, in the works uh, right now to, to possibly add that version um, that would allow you to build clusters of industries where the user defines what are the industries that make up the clusters that they care about. Um, so we're always just sort of thinking about how can we meet the needs of our of our users. Um, so any of those kind of features that you can think of. Um, we're always adding more data variables um, to Census Business Builder. Trying to keep it so it's not, you don't go crazy um, with too much in there, but yet yeah, just the right amount. So we'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. And then uh, under, early and under the LED, you know, LED kind of realm, are there any other uh, tools that you all are looking to put out in the future? So um, not after this veterans employment, um, it'll be a little bit before we start um, creating another data tool, but we are expanding all of the data tools that we have. Um, for example, the job to job flows, it was recently just um, looking at those crossing workers crossing boundaries. Um, and that was only state boundaries, but now we have data down to the metropolitan area. And we also have earnings. So we're always trying to better the products that we do have. Um, and eventually, for like I said, for the PSEO, we will have data for um, New York and Ohio coming in August. And then uh, those other areas that I mentioned, um, they were also, you know, they're also going to be added to the PSEO. I know that there's talk about some um, Oregon State joining. Um, the PSEO um, partnership, but um, that's as far as I have going west. Okay, thanks. Well, it doesn't look like um, we have any other questions in the queue. So uh, I know I'd like to thank my, my census peers for joining us today and uh, Neil, if there's any other um, last comments or thoughts that you have? Uh, no, but uh, again, I, yeah, I want to thank everybody involved. Um, I hope it was very useful and informative for everybody that uh, participated. Uh, again, we will have our second workshop uh, in early June, the first week of June, and I will get more information out on that later on this week. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you to uh, the Puget Sound Regional Council for hosting uh, us census folks today. And we hope to see some of you in a few weeks on uh, June 2nd for the next census workshop.
Great, Katie. Thank, thank you, thank you Heidi. Yep, good afternoon, thank everyone. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.